Well, hiya, BookTube. Bill Rutenberg here with the Rutenberg Library. Wanted to come to you today with a anniversary book haul. So uh, recently, my wife and I celebrated our 21st anniversary uh, together. Uh, I, I'm not sure what's how we've stayed together 21 years, how she's put up with me, but she has. And um, because of that, we went out and uh, went out and ate some... Um, Indian food, uh, talking Indian food from the country of India, um, had a really good meal on, uh, let's see, it been the 29th, so what was that, Thursday, and um, just enjoyed our meal, our big lunch, big buffet lunch, it was awesome, and then uh, from there we went to Barnes & Noble and I picked up a couple items, and then we did some shopping for her, uh, hit some stores that we don't typically uh, get to go to because we live uh, you know, an hour and a half, two hours away from the big city. And so uh, she did some shopping that she wanted to do. And, and then I got to hit another bookstore that was new to me. I had not been to it before, Books A Million, and uh, picked up a few there. And so um, anyway, I wanted to show those to you. And I also got some books in the mail from my friend Paul, and I wanted to show those to you. So I want uh, this is going to be definitely a book haul. I'll try to go a little bit fast. Maybe not. I don't know. I'll, we'll see how it goes here. But uh, anyway, the first book that uh, I'll start with the books Paul sent. And thank you, Paul. I really appreciate these uh, books you've been sending in the mail. Um, definitely going to keep me busy for a while. Uh, I've already read from one of the last times he sent books. i uh, read a couple of those already and thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed them. But uh, I'm kind of wondering if I should have saved them for March Mystery Madness. But eh, that's okay. Anyway, first book he sent was Rick Atkinson's The Long Gray Line, The American Journey of West Point's Class of 1966. And so that'll be really interesting. Um, I have not read anything about this, um, about this class. Um, honestly, I don't even know who's in it. Let's, let's read the back of the book right fast. And, and you guys might be familiar with Rick Atkinson. He's got his famous trilogy, the Liberation Trilogy on World War II. Um, he's also got a, a series for the American Revolution, a trilogy that he's only come out with the first book. And uh, just really good stuff, really good uh, writer. But uh, this book here, the, the Long Gray Line. So a classic of its kind, The Long Gray Line, is the 25-year saga of the West Point class of 1966. With a novelist's eye for detail, Rick Atkinson illuminates this powerful story through the lives of three classmates and the women they loved. From the uh, boisterous cadet years to the fires of Vietnam to the hard peace and internal struggles that followed the war, the rich cast of characters also includes Douglas MacArthur, William C. Westmoreland, and a score of other memorable figures. The class of 1966 straddled a fault line in American history, and Rick Atkinson's masterly book speaks for a generation of American men and women about innocence, patriotism, and the price we pay for our dreams. And so anything by this author, I am game to read. Uh, so looking forward to that. Second book Paul sent me. Uh, he knows I'm a baseball fan, and he saw The Teammates, A Portrait of a Friendship by David Halberstam. And, uh, you know, just a story of the Boston Red Sox here and some of those uh, pretty famous players. The most famous of all of them is probably Ted Williams. Uh, but anyway, uh, thank you for that. Good baseball story. And then... The third book that he sent me was an Abraham Lincoln book. And of course, you know, you can never go wrong with Lincoln when it comes to the Rutenberg Library. Um, I think if I ever get uh, the addition onto my house that I've talked about that I want, there's going to be a whole wing off the library that's going to be the Lincoln wing in the Rutenberg Library. But anyway, I've got a lot of Lincoln books, and I, but I did not have this one. So this is Abraham Lincoln and Men of War Times by A.K. McClure. Uh, introduction by James A. Raleigh. And so uh, real excited to have that. I can always use another Lincoln book. Um, you ask my wife, she might not agree with me, but that's okay. That's okay. Um, so I'll read the back right fast. It says, an associate of Abraham Lincoln offers an intimate view of the president's relations with military men and top politicians, placing particular emphasis on the election campaigns of 1860 and 1864. 
A.K. McClure, a Republican power broker and later editor of the Philadelphia Times, reveals how Lincoln replaced Vice President Hannibal Hamlin with the Southern Democrat Andrew Johnson on the 1864 ticket. According to McClure, Lincoln kept his hand hidden in order to not to offend Hamlin and his New England supporters. In 1892, the, pub, the publication of Abraham Lincoln and Men of, Time, of War Times caused an angry exchange of letters, including in this edition between McClure and the late president's secretary, John G. Nicolay. For all his nobility, Lincoln was a shrewd and cautious politician running scared for re-election until major Union victories in September of 1864. McClure writes candidly about William T. Sherman, Ulysses S. Grant, and George B. McClellan. Among the politicians discussed are Lincoln's predecessor, James Buchanan, who fixed the Southern policy that Lincoln followed until war came, Salmon P. Chase, the annoyingly ambitious Secretary of the Treasury, Edwin Stanton, the moody Secretary of War, and Thaddeus Stevens, the ferocious congressman whose relations with Lincoln were uneasy at best. James A. Raleigh is Carl Adolph Happold, Professor Emeritus of History at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, the author of Turning Points of the Civil War, also available as a Bison book. So anyway, looking forward to reading that, getting into that. It's a, uh, let's see, 496 pages, so good sized book. That'll keep me busy for a little while. Now, the next stack of books... <clears throat> these these next few are from uh, books books a million, and we went to oh maybe I shouldn't try to do that right now. Um, we went to Legends down in Kansas City and went th went to the books a million store and I found a few select titles. Um, this is one that I listened to on audio. It's a middle grade book, but I really really enjoyed it. And I enjoy Lori Hulse Anderson's uh, writing for, for kids, historical fiction for kids. It's Fever, 1793, and it's all about the, the, um, the, the yellow fever that hit Philadelphia during that year. Um, very good account of this. Uh, it kind of centers around a young lady who's going around and trying to save her family. And there's, there's a whole good storyline behind it. It was, it was good. Uh, the next book is 24. Life Stories and Lessons from the Say Hey Kid. And this was uh, by Willie Mays with uh, John Shea. And I've seen that book around, and I've wanted it, and I just haven't pulled the trigger, and I finally saw it there, and I was like, why not? So uh, let, me, let me read the front, or excuse me, the back cover to you. It says, widely regarded as the greatest all-around player in baseball history because of his unparalleled hitting, defense, and base running, the beloved Willie Mays offers people of all ages his lifetime of experience meeting challenges with positivity, integrity, and triumph in 24. Life stories and lessons from the Say Hey Kid. Presented in 24 chapters to correspond with his universally recognized uniform number, Willie's memoir provides more than the story of his role in America's pastime. This is the story of a man who values family and community, engages in charitable causes, especially involving children, and follows a philosophy that encourages hope, hard work, and fulfillment of dreams. So really looking forward to that book. I've read a biography, a big thick biography on him before, and it was it was just amazing what he went through because he was he was during that pivotal generation when uh, African Americans had been playing in the Negro leagues and were starting to move up to the uh, to the major leagues, uh, and he's in that pivotal point in history. So he's got you know a few years with. Who was it? The Alabama or the uh, Birmingham Barons? Am I wrong on that? I'm probably wrong. Anyway, he was in a he was in a Negro League team, and then he ended up getting drafted and or, or bought his contract bought out and moved up to the uh, major leagues. And he's just got a really good story. On uh, I thought he I thought he did a good job of handling a very high pressure situation. Of course, being a really good athlete doesn't hurt anything. <laughs> All right, so the next one I picked up was Franklin and Washington, the founding partnership, and this is by Edward Larson. Um, I was pretty excited about this. I've seen this book for a long time, and I've put off buying it, and I saw it, so I finally went ahead and pulled the trigger and, and bought it. But uh, 
I'll read the inside flap to you. It says, theirs was a three decade long bond that more than any other pairing would forge the United States. Vastly different men, Ben Franklin, an abolitionist free thinker from the urban north, and George Washington, a slaveholding general from the agrarian south, were the indispensable authors of American independence and the two key partners in the attempt to craft a more perfect union at the Constitutional Convention. Held in Franklin's Philadelphia and presided over by Washington, and yet their teamwork had been little remarked upon in the centuries since. Illuminating Franklin and Washington's relationship with striking new detail and energy, Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Edward Larson shows that theirs was truly an intimate working friendship that amplified the talents of each for uh, collective advancement of the American project. During the French and Indian War, Franklin supplied the wagons for General Edward Braddock's ill-fated assault on Fort Duquesne, and Washington buried the general's body under the dirt road traveled by those re retreating wagons. After long supporting British rule, both became early proponents of independence. Rekindled during the Second Continental Congress in 1775, their Friendship gained historical significance during the American Revolution, and when Franklin led America's diplomatic mission to, in Europe, securing money and an alliance with France, and Washington commanded the Continental Army, victory required both of these efforts to succeed, and success, in turn, required their mutual coordination and cooperation. In the 1780s, the two sought to strengthen the Union, leading to the framing and ratification of the Constitution, the founding document that bears their stamp. Franklin and Washington, the two most revered figures of the early Republic, staked their lives and fortunes on the American experiment in liberty and were committed to its uh, preservation. Today, the United States is the world's greatest superpower, and yet we also wrestle with the government Franklin and Washington created more than two centuries ago. The power of the executive branch, the principle of checks and balances in the Electoral College, as well as the wounds of their compromise over slavery, now as the founding institutions appear under new stress, it is time to understand their origins through fresh lens of Larson's Franklin and Washington, a major addition to the literature of the founding era. So, Looking forward to that. I've read Larson before, enjoyed his writing. Um, this next book is awesome. I have read this before. I've been looking for it for my collection. I probably paid a little bit more than I wanted to pay, um, but that's okay because I liked the book that much. I would highly recommend it. It is Shooting Lincoln, Matthew Brady, Alexander Gardner, and the Race to Photograph the Story of the Century by Nicholas Pister. And so this book here... Um, is all about uh, photographing or the race to get to photograph the uh, the um, the hanging of Lincoln's assassins and, or the people. Well, I guess it wasn't the assassin, but everybody that was linked into the assassination. And um, <coughs> excuse me, I read this oh, it was a couple years ago, but uh, absolutely enjoyed it. Uh, it's the story of Matthew Brady and Alexander Gardner. And Gardner, of course, was a really good photographer in his own right, but he worked for Brady. And uh, all of his work at the beginning of the war, the, the credit was given to Brady and his studios. And so Brady always got, you know, all the glory and, and Gardner wanted his own glory. And so uh, they... They broke with each other, and um, like I said, they there was a race to see who could get to photograph the hanging of the assassins. And uh, this is just, I can't talk enough about this. It gives an awesome uh, history of photography during the during the Civil War. It's, it's a mini biography of these two and how they work together. And, um, you know, most uh, or a lot of those famous Civil War pictures that you, you see in Civil War books were by one of these two men, probably by him, maybe under his name, but probably by him. And there were other guys that were in the studio that were pretty good photographers. But anyway, I'm rambling. Can't talk enough about that. If you have not read that book, you need to pick that up. It's a good one. All right. So the last one from Books Books a Million. Excuse me here. The last one is Congress at War, 
how Republican reformers fought the Civil War, defied Lincoln, ended slavery, and remade America. And this is by Fergus M. Bordowich. And I had not seen this one before, I don't believe anyway. And it looked interesting. So let me let me share with you what it says on this uh, on this cover. It says in this absorbing retelling of the Civil War, award-winning historian Fergus M. Bordowich uh, overturns the popular conception that Abraham Lincoln single-handedly led the Union to victory giving us a vivid account of the essential role Congress played in winning the war. Building a riveting narrative around four influential members of Congress, Thaddeus Stevens, William Pitt Fesden, Ben Wade, and the pro-slavery northerner Clement uh, Van Landingham, Bordowich shows us how a newly empowered Republican Party created the conditions for Union success. Congress forcefully pressured President Lincoln to replace timid generals to prosecute the war more aggressively and to declare an end to slavery. The significance of this Congress reached far beyond the battlefield. Its members recognized the war as a unique opportunity to, and seized the moment to fundamentally reshape America. From reinventing the Union, or excuse me, the nation's financial system and keeping the Union's armies in the field to providing for the enlistment of black troops and planning for radical post-war reconstruction, Congress undertook drastic measures to defeat the Confederacy in the process laying the foundation for a strong central government that came fully into being in the 20th century. Brimming with drama and outsized characters, Congress at War is also one of the most original books about the Civil War to appear in years. It will change the way we understand the conflict and its lasting impact. So I thought that sounded interesting. I don't know if I'll agree with all of it because it sounds like the author's going to try to throw Lincoln under the bus a little bit. But so I don't know if I'll, I'll agree with all of it. But it'll be it'll be good to hear his argument. All right. So the last two books in the stack, um, I bought these at Barnes and Noble, and it is my plan. So let me tell you my plans before I show you the books. Um, I've been reading along with. Peg and Martine over at the History Shelf, and they've been reading the Miss Marple books. And um, they started in October and November and then December, so they've read the first three in that series. And I've been reading right along with them and thoroughly enjoying it, so much so that I bought uh, a box set of Miss Marples, the first six in the series, excuse me, um, so that I've got the next three months worth of Marples, uh, so I'm not having to read ebooks. And uh, I just I just kept thinking I've been enjoying these. There's a ton of um, Agatha Christie books out there, and I want to read them all. I'm a completist sometimes, and <coughs> that's where I'm at with these. And so <clears throat> I decided to add into the Agatha Christie project on my end anyway. And starting here in January, I am going to start reading through the Hercule Perot series. And uh, there's, oh goodness, I looked it up the other day. There's a lot in this series. But I plan on reading one a month. Maybe there'll be two if it's a, you know, a month where I can squeeze another one in. But I plan on one a month. And I've already started um, uh, the, the Mysterious Affair at Styles. So that was the very first book in the, in the um, Hercule Perot series. Now, I love this design in the cover. I think it is absolutely wonderful. This is from Vintage Books. Um, and they've got a whole bunch of the Agatha Christie's out there and they're like 10 bucks a piece. And so very, very affordable for a new book and um, just thoroughly enjoying these. So that's the first one I got. And like I said, I started this one, got the first chapter read, did that this morning. And then um, I also picked up the second book in the Hercule Perot series and that is The Murder on the Links. And um, I am just super stoked about, uh, you know, reading these. I guess I could, I could uh, read you the back cover here right fast. So the, the one I'm working on right now, the, the Mysterious Affair at, at Styles, says, Agatha Christie's debut novel was the first to feature Hercule Perrault, her famously eccentric Belgian detective. A refugee of the Great War, Perrault is settling in, in England near Styles Court, the country estate of his wealthy benef benefactress, the elderly Emily Inglethorpe. 
when Emily is poisoned and the authorities are baffled, Perot puts his prodigious sleuthing skills to work. S suspects are plentiful, including the victim's much younger husband, her resentful stepsons, and her hired companion, a family friend working as a nurse, and a London specialist on poisons who just happens to be visiting nearby the village. All of them have secrets they are desperate to keep, but none can outwit Perot as he navigates the ingenious red herrings and the plot twists that earned Christie her well-deserved reputation as the queen of mystery. So I'm real excited about that. And then, um, and it, like I said, it's really good so far. And then this other one, the, the murder on the links, uh, it says, let's see, Agatha Christie's beloved Belgian detective made his second appearance in this tale of murder, blackmail, and forbidden love. When Hercule Perrault rush, rushes to France in response to an urgent and cryptic plea from a client, he arrives just too late. The man who had summoned him is found dead on a golf course, stabbed in the back with a letter opener and wearing an ill-fitting coat with a mysterious love letter in its pocket. Strange circumstances multiply, cult, uh, culminating in the discovery of a second body stabbed with the same weapon. While the local authorities pursue the leads suggested by the evidence, Perot relies instead upon his famous little gray cells to cut through the confusion and untangible, untang excuse me, and untangle the fiendishly clever mystery. So again, like I had said, I love these these covers. They are fantastic. So. Anyway, I got those first two, and that'll help me with my, my personal reading goals of reading through all of Agatha, Agatha Christie's works. But anyway, BookTube, this has been a, like I said, a book haul slash mail haul and some new books into the library. Um, the library's needing a new wing added on. If you if anybody out there wants to add on the wing to my house, I'm, I'm game. <laughs> We're bursting, bursting at the bookshelf, in the bookshelves. But anyway... Um, having fun with these, these new books I'm putting in and, and I'm just looking forward to this new year to, you know, get going and get off on the, uh, right foot and, and get my reading goals accomplished. And that'll be the next video that gets put up on new year's is the, uh, my reading goals for 2023, my TBR, uh, for the year. And I got a lot planned. So check it out tomorrow, check out the new plans. And then the following days, I'm going to, put together the top 10 books that I read in 2022, the top 10 nonfiction, and then I'll put another one for the top 10 fiction books that I read in 2022, and I'll share those with you. Um, anyway, hope you enjoyed this. I really thank you for watching, and until next time, BookTube, happy reading.